Hey guys, in my recent videos I've been showing you this uh, new 6502 computer I've built and this one is the 32 megahertz version that's all running on PCBs uh, and I've uploaded a couple of shorts recently with some demos showing it doing stuff like Mandelbots and things like that um, I thought I'd make a longer video just pulling some of that together adding a few more demos and talking about them in a little bit more detail So here's the first demo I'm going to show you I noticed that Dave's Garage was uh, doing some kind of life demo on a 6 over 2 based computer, so I thought I'd do one similar to that, uh, starting with the word life as the initial pattern and letting it go from there. I think Dave's Garage won, because it's a much older computer, um, that he had to accelerate the video here. This is obviously real time, so that's quite cool. Um, this one, this computer's probably running at least 32 times faster than his one is. I'm not an expert on life algorithms, so I'm sure this could be sped up more. But yeah, it's just what I could put together in a short space of time. Moving on, let's have a little look at this launcher thing I'm using. So the ROM on the computer, it only has about 256 bytes of code in it. And that all that's doing is basically running a serial monitor, uh, which allows the PC to send code to it and run that code. It also has a couple of helper routines that some of the, some of the apps use, uh, but that's really handy because it means it's very easy to get code onto it without having to burn EEPROMs all the time. I wrote the server program in Python. Python has a fairly nice kind of interface for, for serial communications and it supports arbitrary board rates, which is particularly useful. A lot of people would use something like Minicom for this. Um, I like using Python here because it means I can write code that knows how to send data to my computer in whatever form I want, and that's worked really well here. So if I reset the computer, the, the PC is currently waiting for the computer. If I reset it now, you can see that's connected at 250,000 board, and there's a whole bunch of stuff here I can run. So I showed Mandelbrot's before in a short, but I've made a colour version of the Mandelbrot, uh, which is a lot, uh, I guess, a lot nicer to look at there. So there's that. That's doing 32 iterations, but it's a, it's a relatively low resolution because it's a text-based kind of display here. So that's 134 horizontally and 80 vertically. Uh, the font here is really... Uh, Really weird aspect ratio. I've put the code for the Mandelbrot routine, uh, I think minus the colour. I think I put the code up there before I put colour into it. But the code's on GitHub. Um, I'll put a link to that in the description if you want to check that out. Maybe you can run this on your system. Of course, I can also draw a different part of the Mandelbrot set uh, by changing the coordinates. So here's a zoom in on some something along the top edge of the Mandelbrot set. You can see more of the intricacies and sort of repetition and things like that going on here. Moving on, what else have we got? Previously, I showed this uh, Prime Civ program that I wrote. Um, this generates all of the Prime numbers up to about a million, not quite a million. Again, it's sort of based on the stuff that Dave's Garage is doing. He has his uh, his drag race between computers and languages and things like that. I think the challenge there is to see how many times you can generate the Primes up to a million within five seconds. Um, this is quite slow because it's printing them all, but I can run it again in a mode where it doesn't print them and. Uh, That'll be a lot faster. That actually finishes in 562 milliseconds. So I guess this would manage nine times in five seconds, but it didn't quite go to a million there because it doesn't have enough memory. This is using a funny algorithm I thought of. Um, I'm sure it's been done before. People have been generating primes for donkey's years. Um, I thought it was quite clever. It does pack quite a lot of primes into a certain sieve size, but not quite a million within 32k, unfortunately. I think it would need about 40k to store a million primes with this algorithm. So that's unfortunate, um, didn't quite work out. Um, but over on the 6502.org forums, uh, a chap called Big Ed uh, had some suggestions for different algorithms to use, and I implemented one of those. Um, so this is that one running. Um, again, it's not printing the primes, so it can do it very quickly. This did generate all the primes up to a million, uh, and it did it in just under one second. So this algorithm is slightly slower. Not totally sure why, um, but yeah. The code for both of these algorithms is also on a GitHub as well, and I'll put the link to that GitHub in the description as well, in case you want to pick them up and run them on your systems. What else have I got? Again, over on the 6502.org forums, uh, Gordon Henderson um, has released uh, a, a tiny basic. Uh, he called it Jibble, so I uh, had a go at porting that to my system. It was not too hard to do, um, so this is Gordon's interactive basic language I think it says on the screen there so we can uh, do stuff like um, I don't know um, 
print hello I don't know what do you do in basic you do 10 print hello don't you 20 go to 10 how about that there it goes so that will run forever um, yeah that's quite that's quite nice now Gordon's also uploaded the basic code for drawing a Mandelbrot. That's what inspired me to be make, making the 6502 machine code version. Um, so he's uploaded that with the aim of profiling different basic implementations. Um, so I did have, I did give that a go on here. Um, I don't have it saved anywhere, unfortunately, because there's no filing support in this version of basic. Um, but I think that completed in about 40 seconds, which is to be expected. Uh, I think on Gordon's system, which is running at 16 megahertz, it took about 80 seconds, so yeah, you'd expect mine to be twice as fast given the, the clock speed difference. Uh, what else have we got here? Um, I have a CPU speed measurer. Um, the reason I put the CPU speed measurer in is because, uh, as I showed in a previous video, I have a variable frequency oscillator that I'm using. It's like a programmable oscillator. You can set it to whatever frequency you want. Um, it has a weird spread feature though, which unfortunately I didn't turn off in the PCB layout, and it's pretty hard to patch that at the moment. So I'm stuck with this spread feature enabled, and I wanted to know what the actual clock speed it was producing was. Now the spread feature is designed to stop your oscillator generating a consistent frequency all of the time, because I think that's bad for EMI emissions, which people care about when they're doing commercial products. Um, I don't need to care about that because I'm just a hobbyist, but um, yeah, it's, it, it, just, it has that feature to kind of spread the frequencies out a bit so it doesn't have quite, quite such a strong spike at the frequency you pick. Uh, unfortunately, that makes it a bit difficult for me to know exactly what frequency it really, it's really running at, so I created this CPU speed frequency measuring thing in software, uh, and it seems to be very accurate there. It's saying 32.76, and this oscillator is 32.768 megahertz. Uh, moving on, um, I'm going to show you now some of the test programs that I made uh, early on. Um, these are invaluable for making sure that the system is stable, and I'd highly recommend doing this form of testing if you're doing systems like this. I mean, I did it in this case particularly because I am running it at an extremely fast clock rate, um, and stability obviously has to be a concern then. Um, but the first up, I have a, a memory test thing here. Um, this will just blast away uh, testing the memory uh, that's on the system. This uh, is only testing the bottom 32k because the PCB version only has 32k. Um, but it's, 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 it's repeatedly loading values into the memory and then making sure that the same values it put in are still there. It's designed to check that in such a way that if writing to one memory location corrupted another one it would detect that. Um, and it's not always writing the same value to each location. Uh, there's, a, there's some kind of salt in there as well. So. Uh, it's a fairly thorough memory test. I've had this running for days at a time without errors, so that's a good sign. Um, but equally, I have had errors when I've had problems with my circuit, so it's definitely helped me to iron out problems and stability issues in this circuit. In a similar vein, we have Dorman. Now, Klaus Dorman is a guy who wrote about 15 years ago, I think, uh, quite an in-depth test suite for the 6502, um, and it's really invaluable. I think he originally intended it for testing uh, hardware implementations or emulators of the 6502, so that you can make sure your microprocessor is actually implementing the instructions correctly. Um, I don't think it tests things like cycle timing and things like that, but it tests the effect on things like the flags, the registers of all of the instructions and I know some people writing these emulators have been tripped up by it because there were kind of side effects of some instructions which are quite rare and not used very much so it's easy to go without realizing you've implemented it incorrectly. So I think it tests every instruction with every combination of arguments, I'm not totally sure uh, but I can run that here. Oops, sorry, wrong number. And you can see that running. I built the CPU speed measuring into it, as you can see there, just so I could confirm it's running the right speed while it's doing it. Um, and there are two phases here. The first phase it ran is actually phase one instead of phase zero. Um, it's running the 65CO2 extended opcodes test, and this only tests the extra opcodes in the CMOS 65CO2. Uh, the other test phase is phase zero, the 6502 functional test, and that tests the regular instructions that are common to all 6502 processes. So I've kind of 
built them both into the same program here and I've made it just run it continually. It, as you can see, it's designed to have some interactivity to it. You're supposed to press R to repeat, but I made my program just automatically repeat so that it will run indefinitely, but it will stop if it hits an error. And I can actually see on the lights here, when this, is, when this says 13, that's a good sign. Uh, when it hits an error, it tends to say something else. I think it's 10. So um, it's not intentional, but that happens to be what it says on the lights. And that means that I can have this running without even looking at the output and I can still tell that it's working properly. So again, I've had this running for days at a time uh, without any stability problems. At the same time, this has definitely failed at certain points when I had problems with my circuit. And that, uh, that, was, in that was immensely useful, having, having this test suite. So again, highly recommended if you care about the stability of your system. Uh, get hold of some tests like this. Klaus Dorman's tests are available online. Um, it's a little bit of work to build them, they have a funny assembly you have to use to do that, uh, but it's well worth it, highly recommended. Um, soak test your systems because then you know that they're going to be stable and when you have problems with them, you know it's a problem with your code rather than a problem with your hardware. So that's about it for these test programs. This is probably going to be quite a short video, I guess. Um, in terms of the next steps for this system, I really want to get it hooked up to some video output, and I've been thinking about that. It's tricky because it's running at such a fast speed, but at the same time, that will allow it to uh, render higher resolution video output much more effectively than my last system was. This system's five or so times faster, and I think, I think I'm going to see big improvements in that when I do hook this up. Um, I'm not entirely decided whether I want to go with 640x480 or 800x600 or maybe even a pixel doubled sort of 320x240 embedded in 640x480. That last one's interesting because I could just give it more colours that way and it will probably end up with less bandwidth for the CPU overall which will mean it will be even faster at rendering things. So I'm undecided on that at the moment. One thing I am sure of is I don't want to make this one synchronous. I don't want the CPU and the video system in lockstep with each other anymore. I'm tired of doing it that way. I've done lots of circuits that way. It works well, but it ends up being a bit of a burden that these things are tied together. I like that this system lets the CPU run as fast as it possibly can without making any compromises for anything else. And the video circuit would be a huge compromise for that. Um, I do have a system in mind for doing this. It's going to allow the CPU to write to the video circuit as quickly as the CPU can. Um, it's going to be a one-way transmission. It can write to the video circuit, but it can't read back from it. It will be possible to implement reading back at a slower rate at the later date. But I'm not very interested in that. I think writing is the key thing that I want to be able to do here. I don't really mind if I can't read back. And the main thing is to make it as fast as possible. So practically speaking, the fastest uh, 6502 can reasonably write data to an arbitrary location or to an I.O. port or something like that. It's about once every five or six cycles. You can write faster than that, but you're not going to be writing useful data that way because you, while well, you can write the data, you don't have time to read it from anywhere. So practically speaking, although this is running at 32 megahertz, um, maybe if we consider one it once in every eight cycles, it'll be able to write a useful byte of data to the video system. Uh, the effective data rate for the video system will only be 4 megahertz, which is much more in line with the kind of frequency that uh, my typical VGA circuit is used to running at. So I think this will be quite easy to hook up when I get this right, but I just need to get that interface correct between the clock domains and make sure that that's working stably um, and not getting any spurious writes to the video memory and things like that that would cause corruption. Anyway, I haven't fully thought that video circuit through, so I won't go into any more detail than that now. But I do plan to prototype it soon and I'll cover it in another video when I do. I'll put a schematic on the screen here for uh, what I've been planning with this video circuit because I have been discussing it again on the 6502.org forums. The idea is mostly to use FIFOs to uh, kind of marshal the data and make sure that the CPU can write uh, however much it wants and the, and, the, and the video circuit can read that at its own pace afterwards. And so long as they're writing and reading at roughly the same pace, uh, that should work fine and it should bridge between the clock domains. Anyway, hope you found this interesting. Uh, do like, subscribe and so on as usual and let me know in the comments if you've got any questions. You can also head over to the GitHub for the various things that I've uh, linked to in the description. Uh, if you do try them out, let me know. I'd love to hear about it. And if you have problems trying them out or questions about it, just open an issue on GitHub and I'll try to respond to that. See you next time.